coming back on the air. Johnny. Hey, you're still afraid. I'm not afraid. There wasn't a sign of life in that. We've got to do something. Why don't you just keep calm? You're telling us we got to risk our lives just because somebody might need help. Yeah, something like that. I they drag you out there and beat those things. Go ahead. Yeah, they're dead. They're all messed up. Haven't you had enough? They're coming to get you, Barbara. Hello, and welcome to Nightcast, the official Night of the Living Dead podcast. I'm Jim. I've got my hat on, which doesn't fit. Um, and we will be getting to tonight's special guest in a second. But first, I wanted to talk about where you can get this hat and other cool things. That is the Image 10 store at nightofthelivingdead.store. And this is one of the cool items. You're not going to be able to see it with my background, but once I take it off, but it is a quote hat that has all kinds of uh, quotes from the film. My uh, virtual background doesn't like it at all, so I will take it off because it's green. But uh, anyway, um, pop on over to Night of the Living Dead dot store and you can pick up that and a couple of other cool items. We're going to have uh, a little contest this next week, and uh, we'll discuss a little bit more about that as we get into the uh, discussion with our with our guest guest tonight, Russ Dreiner. But uh, in the meantime, I wanted to show you a couple of other uh, neat things that are in the store that um, you may not may or may not have seen if uh, you haven't been keeping up with um, what's happening. And uh, this is one of the cool items is a series of photographic pillows, face pillows. We've got the Karen Cooper, famous Karen Cooper image. And Marilyn's death, which is a pretty neat image for a pillow. And uh, the newscaster telling you to stay tuned to radio and television. And these pillows, uh, these they're basically pillow coverings. They come with pillows, but they're coverings that you can take off and clean and wash and so forth to keep them nice and new. And each one has the Night of the Living Dead logo on the back. So they're reversible. You can always throw that on there. And just to change things up. And so that, again, is that Night of the Living Dead dot store and uh you can buy all those cool things that are there the pillows among them uh, let's see who we've got going here um will phelps of course uh Dwayne's here don fisher from chicago hi don and <laughs> kyra's watching hi kyra nice pillows she says <laughs> and let me see and of course, uh, Russ's favorite person in the world, John Bulo, is here. And I'm sure John's going to have all kinds of great questions for Russ. <laughs> so anyway, uh, let's get right into it with tonight's guest, Russ Streiner. Howdy. Hey, Russ. Howdy. I don't think. Yeah, I'm, I was going to say I don't think you should be as, as much smaller than that. <laughs> Being that you are the guest, I should be small off to the side of the screen. <laughs> I, I'm I'm in your hands, so <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's great to it's, it's great to be participating. I listened uh, to the other uh, podcast, and I I found it to be very informative and entertaining. Uh, <clears throat> I hope I can do uh, the same. And in terms of John Vulo, uh, he and I get along quite well. 
but I must say uh, the guy has more questions and I, I'm just concerned that one of these days I'm going to run out of answers <laughs> and, and, uh, and then I will become uh, the, the village idiot of Night of the Living Dead. Well, he, John's found answers to questions that we didn't even know existed. So kudos to him. But I think at some point he's going to, uh, he's going to ring the, the rag dry and there's not going to be another drop to have come out of it. <laughs> I hope I'm around to see that. <laughs> but anyway, um, so. Uh, Did I see that Joe Senna is tuned in as well? Well, Joe is behind the scenes. He's he's our producer, so uh, he's... Joe Senna is a great guy. I've known him for many years, and uh, uh, he's he's a, a real contribution to have on the uh, Night of the Living Dead team. So yeah, Joe's been um, doing some work with us. Uh, a lot of things that people haven't seen, uh, such as a, a style guide, which goes to all the licensing the companies that license the property and so forth so uh joe's put that together with us and um and and the night of the living dead store and helps to keep this podcast up and running so thanks joe and uh we also have a few other people behind the scenes such as daz and daz does a lot of the uh advertisements and the uh you know keep keeping things uh, fresh in the Facebook groups and on social media for everybody. I, I have so, one uh, about the, the pillows, uh, which are quite uh, stunning. Uh, I don't know that I'll be getting either the Maryland one or the Cairo one uh, <clears throat> for this reason. I live with two cats, Batman <laughs> and Chase, and very frequently... I will wake up at three o'clock in the morning and have this oversized cat face staring, <laughs> staring at me and startling me awake. And I'm, I'm concerned that the, uh, that the Kyra and the Maryland pillows uh, uh, might join that, that club. If I had them on my bed, I can't imagine uh, waking up that close to Kyra's face. <laughs> We'll have to come up with a uh, a, a cat themed uh, set of uh, you know couchware <laughs> that the cats can have fun with. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I don't know if there's like a crossover there we can work on. Um, so anyway, uh, we wanted to have you on um, because uh, as most of the people that go to the conventions and the appearances, the personal appearances know uh, that. You're a wealth of information about Night of the Living Dead, having been uh, working on, having worked on the film from probably the very first day that it was even a kernel of uh, an idea to make a feature film up until, you know, uh, the last few years and all the, uh, all the changes and the elevation of the film along with Image 10. Uh, which you've been a part of all that. So um, we wanted to talk about coming up. Um, you have a number of appearances and uh, which, you know, people, which are going to cover a large area um, throughout the USA. And so hopefully uh, some of the fans will get to come out and meet you. Um, the first one that we have um, is the, you have a screening at the Michigan Theater in Jackson, Michigan, on the 21st of September. And what could you tell us about what's happening with that? This is a, a unique uh, situation. And uh, for uh, Jackson, Michigan, it's also a cultural event. Uh, they, the folks in uh, Jackson have spent, uh, I think, more than a year restoring a grand old movie theater uh, in Jackson. And as part of the re-premiere of the restored theater, 
uh, they made the choice to show Night of the Living Dead, and they invited John Russo and myself to be there uh, to attend the screening, answer questions, sign some autographs, that kind of thing. So it's a little bit different than a uh, the usual convention appearance. Uh, I would say that this is a much more, um, if I had to choose some words, I would say up close and personal. And the, the people who are at this rededication of the theater are not only supporting a great uh, cultural venue in their area, uh, they decided to uh, have Night of the Living Dead as part of that celebration. So um, we're honored on uh, both ends of it, um, both as a cultural event and the fact that they uh, thought uh, highly enough of Night of the Living Dead to include it in their program. Great. So people wanting more information can find that at Michigan theater.org that's again saturday september 21st and they are showing the uh, we have license to the uh 4k restored night of the living dead from janice films so good on that and it looks like we have somebody joining us here and there what did is. i miss what did i miss <laughs> i'm sure it was nothing important <laughs> So do you have guys. one of those you have one of those moving backgrounds like they have on TV shows like you know they put people in a car <laughs> and move the background is that what's happening in I'm 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 ag cool. I'm actually driving somewhere I have no idea where um For those yeah. of you who don't know this is my brother Gary <laughs> <laughs> I'm here so what it what's what's been said is what I want to know well, we stopped talking about you at this point. Yeah, I bet. And, uh, <laughs> uh, Jim, I wanted to, Jim and Gary both, I wanted to ask you this question. Is there anything that I am not allowed to say? Because uh, I've got ideas that pop into my mind that uh, and sometime my uh, editorial filter is uh, not working properly. <laughs> If there's anything that I should not talk about, just let me know now. Uh, Joe has the uh, know you know the mute button, so he'll just. Uh, <laughs> 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 we're not we're not on much of a delay, so if you really launch into something, I don't think we'll be able. If to you stop. all of a sudden say no, 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 not that, Russ, don't talk about that. That'll be your indication. <laughs> you can't talk about that. Not that. Oh my God. <laughs> Oh, we There's were Russ. talking about uh, uh, Russ's. Well, uh, I understand that John Hulo is lurking in the background someplace. Oh, no. <laughs> and it is highly likely that, that John may try to tax me at some point. Well, it's, it's yeah. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and, and, and it's inevitable. You can't, you know, you can't get away from it. <laughs> So what? So what? What? What were we talking about? Just pretend I'm not just driving my car, <laughs> <laughs> and it's all hands free, people. Don't worry, I'm not like. Well, I'm are, not Gary, are you anything. literally driving right now? I am literally, <laughs> yes, literally driving moving. right now. Well, I can see it now, and yes. I don't know why, <laughs> and I don't know where. <laughs> <laughs> I, I unfortunately we when the night got switched I had already made um, plans with um, uh, friends to have dinner and so I I don't know what's happening I'm getting some kind of weird feedback now on me but um, why I'm on twice actually I'm I have two screens that's why uh oh. I don't know why. For those of you who don't know, uh, Gary lives in the area where Night of the Living Dead was filmed, uh, Evans City, Pennsylvania. And the background that you see behind Jim right now is no longer an open field. The McElhaney family grows corn in that field now. And it is probably the best corn that I've ever had anywhere. 
And when this podcast is over tonight, uh, I have a couple of ears that I'm going to stuff in the microwave and have some open corn. So at least now that topic is out of the road. And Gary is driving the truck that was blown up. They saved it, right? <laughs> Just a. We have, we, have, we have named this, uh, it, it used to be Night Talk in the old show, but it is now the Nightcast mobile unit, yes. And typically when I start these things on time, I'm in the cemetery. Although what I'm realizing, because I live so close to it, and I get good reception up there, but um, it, because but what I'm looking at here is like 8:15 right now, and it's practically dark. So <laughs> I'm not going to be able to do it for uh, you know for nightcast anymore. I'm going to have to figure out a new a new routine. So John Bull anyway. is saying, uh, "Don't worry about questions. He's here to learn." So. <laughs> <laughs> So we better uh, we're we better all come here up to with learn. some information to to help him out there. So anyway, I, continuing I, on what we were talking about, uh, Russ's the first appearance on Russ's schedule is the Michigan Theater September twenty first. That's a Saturday, and then the following weekend, Russ will be at Terracon in Marlboro, Mass. And that is going to be, uh, that's a three-day show, unlike the uh, Michigan Theater show, which is, uh, which is one day in a screening of the film. You get all the info at theterracon.com. And um, Russ is going to be, he's not going to be there alone. He's going to be joined by his sister, Judy O'Day. And also... Judy Ridley and Ira Show. Woohoo, 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 woohoo. So come and see those people. When was the last time you were out in Massachusetts, Russ? It's actually been a while. Uh, but the the uh, the gathering of the uh, these so-called mini cast reunions are so much fun to do because first of all, uh, we get to see one another. Uh, and that is always a good time. Uh, the, the remaining cast members uh, all get along with one another, and uh, we have a good time, and I think the audience has a good time as well. Uh, we try to be who we are, and that's pretty cordial people. So um, it's I've, I've heard some horror stories about people showing up at conventions and um, the people that they're, that they're coming to see are not very gracious and, and uh, uh, that sort of thing. That is absolutely not the case with the Night of the Living Dead cast uh, uh, to a person. Uh, we enjoy talking with uh, uh, people who are coming to see us. And uh, it's, it's actually, without getting too philosophical about it, it, it really is a two-way street. Uh, people are coming to see us who have been in a movie that they've seen maybe many, many times over many, many years. And we, for the first time, are getting to see them. And so that exchange dynamic is always very, very interesting. I, I don't recall any incident where I ever thought, Oh boy, I sure wish this person would move along. Uh, and and guess what? Oh, I it have. Is, <laughs> it's also generational. Uh, uh, we are seeing adults, grandparents. We're seeing parents. We're seeing uh, teenagers that that all get the same kind of um, satisfaction out of watching Night of the Living Dead as uh, uh, everyone did almost 56 years ago. You know, someone uh, asked me a question um, probably in two, maybe 2009 even, back in the very early beginnings of the Living Dead Fest. 
uh, which I thought was all, was an interesting question, and and I had to pause to think what my answer was. Um, they said, "What what was more uh, rewarding to you, um, making the film in the first place, or?" putting on this festival where all these people that adore the film come every year to, to celebrate it. And there wasn't even really a hesitation. You know, when we made Night of the Living Dead, um, it was a job. You know, we were, we were working and, and sometimes not knowing exactly how we were going to finish everything that, that, that we needed to do. And, all the time and money constrictions and all that sort of stuff, but but it was a job, and I'm proud of it. I'm proud of the job that we all did on it. But to actually be able to sort of press the flash and actually be able to uh, get fan reaction to why they thought it was great is um, uh, that's pretty special. And so I think it. It, it goes along with what Russ is saying. It's like, it never gets old. Uh, I don't think it, 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 there's always, even the people you see uh, show after show after show, they're, you know, they're always extremely polite and they're extremely um, eager to talk and see what you've been up to. Um, and, and, and just, it, it, it's kind of just a general love fest. So I, I have to say that the, uh, doing the conventions and, and 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 we'll get on to another convention that's going to happen but that that will happen when jim deems it time <laughs> so uh yes i i agree russ i i think that you know just just being able to meet the people who admire the, the what what you have done uh, that that to me is even better than you know the original making of Okay, that's well, my Larry, when I, you were making. I have a question for you. Do I was going to say when you were making that movie and uh, um, were making any any movie or any kind of work, you didn't know that conventions would actually be a thing. So that that wasn't quite something that was in anybody's purview no. coming down the road, right? We we were always just you know be thankful. Sorry, I'm. Coming back, my bumpy driveway. <laughs> um, this is actually quite charming. I'm, I hope we can um, kind of see that the uh, <laughs> that it's eight o'clock, but it isn't still light where Gary is. <laughs> yeah, it's it's. Uh, I'll put on my I'll put I'll I'll put my lighting package on in a minute here when I stop. Um, i now I forget what the point was. Um, what what was your question, Jim? Do you remember? Well, just a just a point that uh, um, when you were making either Night of the Living oh. Dead or any of the other films, it wasn't even a, a an idea that you could be at a convention appearance or ultimately have a convention just based on one film. There were there weren't even I mean I'm sure there were happening, but there as we know them today, there there weren't conventions, <laughs> you know, back then. Um, Hold on, let me get my lighting complement up and working. That's better, huh? <laughs> yes, you were slowly fading to black. Yeah, now I'm now I'm under artific artificial light now. I <clears throat> anyway, it's it's so funny, but yeah, no, you don't you don't know. You know, our hope was is that it would get on screens where somebody could see it. You know, we had no. <laughs> indication that that um you know sorry i'm still trying to adjust my camera down here um you know we had no indication that that it would be what it turned out to be so um that's that it's it's it is it is and 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 the fact that it's 56 years old and people still line up you know, to get autographs just just speaks volumes um, uh, of what the impact this film has had on the public. Cool. Uh, Russ, you had a question? 
before we move on to the next? No. Uh -uh. Okay. So uh, just to recap, we've got Judy O'Day, Russ Dreiner, Judith Ridley, and Kyra Schoen coming to TerraCon, which is in Marlboro, Mass., September 27th through the 29th. And you can find more information there, theterracon.com. Cool. So uh, that's uh, two consecutive weekends, which will round out September. And then a month later, you guys are going to be going, well, let's bring it up. We've got Weekend of the Dead in Manchester, UK. <laughs> and that's both of you going. Gary's first time there. Russ has been there before. When was the last time you were at uh, Weekend of the Dead, Russ? I believe it was uh, 2000, uh, uh, 2020, I believe. It was, it was literally days uh, before, before the pandemic shut everything. Before they shut, yeah, they shut the uh, flights down. Yeah. So, uh, and I was, I was supposed to go. I was supposed to go. I don't know. It prob was probably 21, maybe even 20. Um, but I fell and injured my knee and had to have a knee operation. And, and uh, that put me out of going. So um, I think that is, was and, even before. I think that was even. It might have been that. even before that. It might have been, been even like 19. 2019. Yeah. 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 Um, so At it's. Any it's rate, uh, uh, the, the group in uh, Manchester, England, they're just fantastic people. It's the largest uh, George Romero-centered convention in, uh, in Europe that I know of. Uh, and they're just delightful people, um, uh, true fans. Uh, and the people who come to that show are also true fans. So it's... Uh, once you adjust to the fact that they talk a little bit funny, uh, it, it, it's just, it's a wonderful great gathering of uh, uh, U UK and European fans of uh, Night of the Living Dead and, and George Romero's pictures in general. Great time. So more information about that for... You folks from the UK. And, 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 it, and it, it's kind of the first time that Russ and I have actually done a convention together. I yeah. mean, we've been to lo lots of conventions together, but this is this is the first time. In fact, with the way it originally started out, I didn't know that they had invited Russ and they invited me. And I kind of said, you know what? I think my traveling days are over. I, I, I don't think I want to make a trip to, to Manchester. And uh, then it was mentioned that Russ was going to be there. Um, and I said, oh, well, then that that's, makes a good opportunity for the Striner brothers to finally be on the bill as headliners for the first time ever. So. Yeah. Russ has always been the star, and I've always kind of, you know, snuck in wherever I could get in. <laughs> that's, what, that's what an on-camera appearance will do for you. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Well, and what an on-camera performance, you know. I mean, come on, legendary. Uh, if it would have been an average uh, on-camera, you might not be – you may, may, may have to pay for your own flight to Manchester. <laughs> So, Russ, David McCartan is saying that he met you at Weekend of the Dead in uh, 2017. So, this will be your third time going? Yes. So, yeah, um, uh, about that. Uh, yeah, so, we've talked about three appearances. And as Gary has said, I mean, it's three appearances over about a month and a half, um, the span of a month and a half. But as Gary was saying, you know, his initial reaction was, well, my traveling days are over. Uh, let's talk about that, you know, a little bit about how, uh, you know, what does this 
entail? I mean, you're going to be going to Michigan, to Massachusetts, and then to Manchester. Um, it's not as easy as it sounds, right? <laughs> well, uh, for me, it is not. Um, I, I have always got to deal with the fact that uh, the on-screen Johnny was 27. But today, Russ Striner is 84. <laughs> and some things have changed uh, in those inter intervening years. Um, not all of them have been kind to Russ Striner, but um, one of the things that keeps me going is this, um, this two-way street with the fans um, I will do it as long as I'm capable of doing it. Um, and um, so that doesn't mean that you can expect to see Johnny drooling into a bowl of oatmeal cookies, I, I hope. <laughs> if that's not the case. Uh, that when you come to see Russ Striner, you're at least seeing a, a somewhat coherent I'd like to I, I kind of would like to see Russ Dreiner drooling into a, bo a bowl of cookies. <laughs> you, you may be the only one. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's another side of yeah. Hey, it's another. It's another. Another side of fandom. You know. <laughs> I should keep no. my mouth shut because John Vullo is now going to want photographs of me drooling <laughs> into a bowl of oatmeal cookies. If, if it leads to him finding another person that he hasn't found yet, yes, he will want that. So uh, he, he would go down that rabbit hole in a second. But, uh, you know, but so that, I mean, look, the uh, not just for you, but the travel is difficult for everybody. And, uh, uh, you know, little by little, we're, trying to figure out the best way to accomplish, uh, you know, these, these kinds of, uh, uh, what, it, it does. 50, 56 years later, I mean, we're lucky we have four of the principles from the film, uh, right. plus, you know, plus the, the extra, um, people we can, you know, the supporting players we could have in there. So, uh, that part is lucky, but getting everybody around to, the various places and they're already, you know, everybody's living in a different part of the country well, what, as it is. What, what people don't understand is, is that, you know, it, especially living in Pittsburgh uh, right now, Pittsburgh actually used to be a pretty big hub. It had, um, it was called in the beginning, it was Allegheny airlines and then it turned, it uh, tra turned into us air and U.S. Air at Pittsburgh was U.S. Air's home base. So you could connect anywhere without any problems. And, and most times it was a direct flight, you know. So if you were flying to Los Angeles, for instance, you know, you, you would know that it would be about a four and a half or five hour flight. But now you, there are no direct flights. There are no direct flights anywhere. You know, so it, what it means is, is what was a five hour trip is now a 10 or an 11 hour trip. And, um, you know, and, and, and particularly like going to the UK, you know, and, and Manchester, <laughs> no less. Yeah. It's not like we're, it's not like we're going to to London, you know. So um, <clears throat> we did a lot of behind the scenes for the people that don't know about this. Okay, there was a lot of behind the scenes juggling and uh what do they call that not uh not gymnastics logistics. Um, logistics there you go there was a lot of logistical work done to make it so these guys can get to manchester in one piece and uh you know uh, just the time difference and everything i mean you're, you're talking about for anybody it's an easy yeah you know 12 hour excursion and as Gary's saying, there are no direct flights anymore from Pittsburgh. It's even within the United States, it's difficult to get everybody coming from Pittsburgh to different different areas uh, where conventions are being held. Um, you know, most conventions aren't being held like right in downtown New York City. I mean, the, these kind of pop culture conventions tend to be 
like in the suburbs or uh, you know the those areas, the suburbs outside of uh, you know major cities, but certainly nothing as uh, um, you know common as New York City, where there's three possible airports and there are um, direct flights. So uh, a lot of work was done to make it as easy for these guys as possible to get there. Well, it, it, uh, it, and at one point, it, it, every it, convention, you know, <laughs> we're trying to make it easy for for people to get there. But the bottom line is to all the attendees is don't take these for granted. If you do have the chance to go out and meet the guests from Night of Living Dead, uh, the cast and the crew, go and do it because um, it's it's harder and harder to get everybody out to to where they need to be. At yeah, this yeah. At the show in Manchester, uh, also from the original uh, cast and core group is uh, John Russo is going to be at Manchester this year as well. So uh, uh, there will be good representation from the original Night of the Living Dead at this year's show. Again, you can get all the uh, see who else from the Romero universe is appearing at the show in Manchester if you go to weekendofthedead.uk. I'm sorry, Gary, you had you were saying something? Uh, no. <laughs> no? <laughs> no, no, no? Nothing important. No, uh, other than it's not only the travel issue, it's... Um, you know, I, I mean, I think Kyra is younger than me, but um, not by much. And, you know, it it, it just gets harder as it, it um, you know, we get older. We get a bit more rigid than, uh, you know, what, what, hey, I used to just jump in my car or my truck and drive to New York like any time. You know, it was never even a second thought. But for me to now... And I, to go to New York or go to Connecticut, where I would love to go because I have lots and lots of friends there from, you know, the career that I was in. Um, but it's just not in the cards, you know, for to think of getting in a in a vehicle and driving for, you know, six hours, six and a half hours. Uh, it's it it it, it gets tough. No, I'm not complaining. I'm just state and fact you know so yeah, it's, just, it's the reality uh, it, it's the, not like it's not like we're prima donnas <laughs> you know i don't want that you know you, you to get that the fans to get that it, those impressions it, and and i can't say that the you know working on the booking end of it i can't say that the promoters aren't paying uh you know nobody's asking anybody right. to like cut rate but i mean the airlines right. are just not delivering they just don't have the schedules and then when flights are canceled, people are shuttled around, and and some of the some of the guests are, you know, it's adding hours onto their travel time. And I don't like it at my age. I can't imagine if I was in my, you know, mid to late seventies how difficult that would be. And again, well, it's, it's not, not it's not from the promoters saying, well, we can only, you know, we we try to keep the 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 uh you know the price is uh reasonable but it you know i haven't had any promoters you know say well you have to fly you know one of these uh discount airlines whose names i won't mention um you know they are doing what it takes to get everybody out there and travel has just become difficult oh uh, you know just as an example which i didn't believe him <laughs> oddly enough uh, shortly before this whole UK trip uh, came up, my son was telling me about a trip that he wanted to take to San Francisco. And, um, you know, <laughs> he's saying there's only one flight a day uh, from Pittsburgh to San Francisco and one flight back. And if you can't get on that, and, and so it's a direct flight, not nonstop. <clears throat> with uh, Spirit Airlines, and 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 he said if I but he said but if I can't get booked on that when I want to go, it's going to take me fourteen hours <laughs> to get from from Pittsburgh to San Francisco. And I go, Aaron, you're crazy. I've traveled all my life. <laughs> I said that's it, ridiculous. Of course, and he goes, well. 
try to find out. And before I actually went and did anything, the next thing that happened is Jim saying, I don't know how in the hell we're going to get you three over to the UK because there are no flights. There's no flights that make it. <clears throat> and just luckily, we just finally, you know, sliced it up in a different way uh, where we could, you know, we'll, we'll be able now to fly from JFK right to Manchester. So, uh, but we still have to get from Pittsburgh to, you know, to JFK. So that, that, that's part of the travel arrangements we still don't have. But if worse comes to worse, we, we can drive there, you know, so. And don't get the idea that Pittsburgh is a is a backwater town. It isn't. It's a it's a thriving urban area. <clears throat> uh, great medical center. Uh, uh, all kinds of things. The the, the base of uh, business has shifted from uh, steel making, uh, which it was when Gary and I were growing up here. It was the steel making capital of probably the world. And that right. has slowly, slowly transitioned to uh, medical, to high tech, uh, to robotics. Uh, so it's not, it, it's really not a backwater town. And it is all related to the uh, circumstance when uh, U.S. Airways uh, uh, closed up. Uh, it left that transportation vacuum uh, in Pittsburgh. And it's important to me in another regard because 30 years ago, 34 years ago now, I started an organization that is called the Pittsburgh Film Office. The Pittsburgh Film Office is an economic development agency that um, it was created to attract movie production to Pittsburgh. And we've had great, great success at doing that to the point that up until the pandemic, we were generating about uh, $150 million into the local economy annually. Uh, and But to get uh, production executives from Los Angeles or New York or wherever, uh, plus cast uh, members to Pittsburgh, they go through the same kind of headache. So it has uh, a, a real dynamic effect on the uh, potential of uh, economic growth in this area. And it's a problem that I don't know uh, how they're, they're going to solve it. I did see just within the last two weeks, believe it or not, electric airplanes, which, right. are, which are currently being used by the military and other services. But I'm, the, the report that I saw said that as of next year, um, expect to see electric airplanes. Uh, we saw the uh, when we were out in uh, Phoenix. We saw the uh, uh, driving, self-driving cars. Right? I think yes, those are right. electric too. So, but yeah, it, look, uh, the thing that you're uh, talking about, you know, so there's all this innovation in those areas. But um, in the last, well, even before the pandemic, I mean, I've been regularly coming out to Monroeville for the Living Dead Festival. Uh, no, I'm mixing up the names now. Gary, tell me what the name of Kevin's event is. <laughs> the Living Dead Weekend, there you go. Uh, I've been coming out to Monroe, but Monroeville is just as busy. And I mean, that is, a, what, a good 30, 40 minutes from, from Pittsburgh, downtown Pittsburgh. Monroeville is just as busy as any area where I live up here in northern New Jersey. I live in one of the dense, most densely populated uh, areas in the country. It, it, our county is one of the most densely populated counties that there is uh, because New Jersey is already a small state and we just have so many people packed in. And of course, everybody has vehicles and there's mass transit, you know, whatever there can be, buses and so forth. But uh, 
Monroeville is just as busy yeah, as that. Oh, it's it's ball ball ever not even close to, uh, you know, you're not even close to Pittsburgh and you, you still have that kind of traffic. So, um, you know, it's, and to see, uh, you know, our, our state is expensive, but we also have very high wages. And to see, you know, politicians say, well, you don't need to be making so much money uh, if you're over in this state or that state, you could be making a lot less. So we keep the minimum wage at something ridiculous like 725 is absolutely ridiculous. We've been all over the place with just Night of the Living Dead reunions all over the country and everything costs the same and it's busy. <laughs> And uh, there's a lot of people. So, uh, you know, things should be the same everywhere, but they're not. So we get what we get. But a um, few people had a few questions here. Uh, David had a pretty good one about, um, he's saying he's not a big advocate for remakes, but he thinks Night of the Living Dead would be great to revisit every generation. And apart from the 1990 version, is there or was there any conversation to have another big screen adaptation made of, of Night of the Living Dead? So uh, that's this answer actually has a lot of uh, a lot of moving <laughs> parts to it. <laughs> but um, in a nutshell, I could say uh, Image 10 uh, does not have the rights to make another Night of the Living Dead. Those rights actually reside with Christine Romero, uh, George's uh, uh, ex-wife, uh, from uh, before his, you know, be, before George passed away, he was with um, Suzanne Romero, who everybody knows. Christine was his uh, previous wife, and and she was involved with a lot of the productions from, oh, that be from like Martin, or maybe even uh, Jack's wife. Right? Was Christine involved with Jack's wife, Gary? I believe she was. So from Jack's wife onward until uh, yeah. about the time of Land of the Dead, Christine was involved in all those productions. And George's, uh, George and Christine's production company called Sanibel Films inherited the rights to make a sequel or a continuation of the 1968 uh, Night of the Living Dead story. So uh, um, we've... And this happened around the time of the the remake being made, the 1990 remake being made. So, for what is that? A good 30 years, there was really well, at least 30 years. Uh, so 2020, maybe a little bit before then, good uh, 25 to 30 years. There was really no talk of there being any kind of Night of the Living Dead remake. These uh, these rights just kind of existed uh um or these this transference of rights just kind of existed there and there was no real push to be making another movie or to license that license it out to a screenwriter or director who who had the idea to uh to do kind of like a generational retelling as as david is is asking but um that has since come up and christine is uh, has licensed out the rights and there has been some, uh, you could look it up online. There has been some publicity about it, but it, it's not anything that's entered into uh, production yet. So um, we're waiting just like everybody else because Image 10 does have some involvement if Sanibel Films does exercise those rights to make a uh, another generational retelling of the story. Now, I agree with David. Um, I like to see it as, to me, it's like each generation should tell their own story of Night of the Living Dead. So I'm looking forward to somebody doing something new. And if you look up the news online, what, what news has been put out there, there is a, you know, a new director and a new screenwriter, and they're not necessarily horror genre people, artists. Uh, which I think is a good idea. And so, uh, you know, they can tell their own version of a similar story based on George's uh, film. Hey, hey you guys, guys have anything I don't to know add? if you can hear me, but I've, I've yes. lost sound. Uh, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut off. We're almost to the end of this anyway, so I'm going to cut off here.
sorry about that, but <clears throat> a technical issue with the um, Nightcast mobile unit. We'll have to get it into the shop and get that sorted out. But anyway, I'm, I'm glad. I, I, again, I'm hoping you can hear me because I, I can, nod your head if you can hear me. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I appreciate being on. I'm, I'm happy that Russ got to be on and have a little exposure to all this stuff. Um, and I'm sure he'll be a guest more frequently. And uh, we'll, we'll keep you abreast. We're going to do this on a, a regular basis for sure. So um, again, sorry for the technical difficulty, but I I could sit here and talk to myself all night. I, I, I need to hear you guys too. So I'm going to sign off. Take care. Have a good one, guys. Don't let them get you. <laughs> uh, as a follow-up, Jim, to what David was asking, um, about as close as uh, we are getting, and uh, Image 10 is involved in this as well, uh, because uh, it, Image 10, John Russo and I have decided that we are going to tell the story of the early days. Uh, when George and I first got started, before... Uh, before any feature films were ever considered, we knew we wanted to make feature films, but we had no idea of how to get from point A to point B. So in the early, very early 60s, we started a company called The Latent Image. And that was where we all came together. George Romero, myself, Rudy Ritchie, Richard Ritchie, John Russo, Gary Streiner, Vince Servinsky, um, and we were making a living. We were keeping groceries on the table by doing any kind of films that needed to be done. We were brand new at it. We were bumbling our way through on a day-to-day -day existence. I facetiously say um, it... <laughs> it is facetiously, that we were kind of the beavis and buttheads of trying to make movies. Well, guess what? Uh, we kept at it and kept at it and kept at it all through the early 60s, the mid 60s. And by 67, we finally got our act together uh, and financing together to pull off Night of the Living Dead. So uh, I, I guess there's something to be said about the, telling the story of the little engine that could. And we'll talk uh, more about that at a, perhaps in another show. Russ, we had, um, had one more question I want to get to before we wrap it up, but we had a, a crazy question from Craig saying, um, let's settle the debate. I didn't know it was a debate. Um, let's settle the debate. What was the candy Barbara and Johnny were eating? If there is no answer, we will accept Russ's favorite candy. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be. So, really so there was none of that candy left, right? There was none of that candy left, which means that I'm you would have be devoured brutally, it. Brutally, brutally honest. <laughs> I don't know where that line came from. I don't know what it was in reference to, but. It, it was in my script, so I said it. Hey, is there any of that candy left? <laughs> if I were to provide more detail to it, I would probably say that the candy would have been either M&Ms or Good and Plenty's. So if you'll, if you'll accept that as an answer, that's about as close as I can come to giving a real answer. Actually, let's uh, this this will lead into DeVoy's. I want to get to DeVoy Peter's question, which is, um, what was it like pulling Judy O'Day out the front door? But before we we get to that, um, this is a good lead into that. So you're saying that that line was in the script, right? Um, I believe most of the intro was very well scripted, but some of the other scenes in the film were not. 
um, and, and including uh, your, you know, obviously your uh, cemetery struggle with Bill Heinzman as, as the as the head, you know, the main cemetery ghoul, the audience's first exposure and Johnny and Barbara's first exposure to, uh, you know, there's something wrong. Um, Bill wasn't the, you know, that was decided later that Bill would be the, the cemetery ghoul. And um, and at some point, uh, as as Bill said, from his perspective, it was like, okay, now you have to kill this guy. And he's like, whoa, whoa wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. In the whole movie, he's you know he's been uh, you know because he was in the other scenes of the ghouls surrounding the farmhouse, and you know he was told, well, you know you don't really have any strength, you know you really can't, uh. You're not you. You don't have any strength unless you're all working together and kind of like crowding into the, into the doors and the windows and you know pushing them in and then you know then you have the ability to uh, to do something. But otherwise you're slow and you're not you're not able to really pull that off. And he's like, uh, you know, we I had to make it up on the spot. What was your experience as from the Johnny end that you have to struggle with this? unknown individual you know don't the audience doesn't know and johnny doesn't know that it's a living dead uh you know corpse so uh what was from your experience that you know well johnny has to die now Uh, well i won't make any pretense about it it was the, the 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 deep dive character research uh, did not take place in terms of uh, what, h- how defenseless are these things? How much struggling can they do? Uh, a lot of that was actually improvisational. Uh, we had to make it look good. We had to make it seem as though they were a real threat. So maybe Bill Heinzman, uh, had a, when he conked my head on the gravestone, uh, it, maybe that was a stroke of luck for him. Right. Uh, what, would, what would have been George's, here, along those lines, what would have been George's direction? I mean, George knew what he had to get on film. So it's like, okay, you guys are fighting and now you have to die. So yeah. was, was there anything that comes to mind that George would have said back then? Well, one of the things that that was happening is that <clears throat> the script was being written, but at the same time was partially improvisational. We had a couple of sessions uh, where George, John Russo, myself, Carl Hardman, Marilyn Eastman sat down and had what if conversations. This was before we started filming. What if this happened? What if that happened? And then George and John Russo would go away and they would cobble together a story, a script based on those what if conversations. The one thing that was determined early on was that Johnny was he, he he was going to get his head conked on the on the gravestone but he was going to come back okay when that decision was made that's when i decided that i would give johnny the black driving gloves and it's why johnny made such a fuss about he, he was all in, early in the film. He was always fussing with the the driving gloves. The reason is, once he got his head conked on the on the gravestone, Johnny was going to be out of the picture. The only references to Johnny were Barbara yearning for him from the house. Oh, Johnny's out there. We have to get to Johnny. Johnny has the keys. Johnny has this. Johnny has that. Well, the audience believes that. Boom, Johnny got his head hit on the tombstone, and that's it for Johnny. Where the driving gloves came into play is that I knew when Johnny came back, 
as a recently dead person, I wanted his, uh, I wanted his uh, reappearance to be striking. Uh, his glasses were gone. Um, the audience hasn't seen him since, what, seven or eight minutes into the film, other than Barbara's references to him. Uh, but haha, the wardrobe signature of the, the, the hand with the black driving glove coming up on the white door frame, the audience would instantly know, aha, this is Johnny. Even though he's surrounded on the porch by these other things, his glasses are gone and so forth, the audience knows for absolutely certain, plus <laughs> Barbara is screaming, Johnny, Johnny, <laughs> that Johnny was back, but in a way that nobody uh, had anticipated he would come back. And, and so that rounded out one of the very nice story points in, uh, in Night of the Living Dead. And so you're saying it was, um, uh, that was determined early because that's not part of the script. Part of the script is that Ben pulls Barbara down to the basement with him. Yeah. And then Ben goes, and then Barbara survives the night with Ben. But when Ben goes upstairs, he alone is shot. Right. Exactly. So you're saying that that was determined early, the, the kind of ironic twist that exactly would come it, back. Came, it came out of one of those uh, uh, what if conversations. And, and, and it also indicates a little bit of the uh, improvisational style of the film that, um, yes, we had a general story that we were following, but if a good idea came along, uh, we also incorporated it the best we could. And then it was George's uh, genius that pulled all of that together from the shot composition to the selection of the library music to the, the editing. Uh, that, that part of the production uh, remained pretty much George's domain. And we would look at the daily progress and so forth and make a suggestion, how about if this, how about if that? But it was basically, basically uh, uh, George's baby from that point on. Once it got to the editing room, um, George was the, without a question, was the key player. Just really quickly, uh, Joe Burton's asking, he's always been curious why the cemetery ghoul didn't eat Johnny but instead went after Barbara. Um, and to, to me, that's a, um, to me, that's, you, you talk about like these brainstorming sessions and, um, and, you know, others have said the same thing, you know, Chuck Craig talked about things like that. Um, you know, he would go off and write his news copy and then there would be maybe a discussion about, well, this little bit and piece here, uh, Bill Heinzman talked about, um, you know, well, Hey, what about one of those satellites? What if that comes back? If we need an explanation, you know, things like that. It seems like everybody was trying to do just as opposed to what you would see in typical 1950s, early 1960s science fiction melodrama. Everybody was trying to do the more logical, you know, how, how do we take this concept and make it logical? So to me, this, um, to me, it's always made sense why. The cemetery ghoul doesn't eat Johnny. Why the uh, why Karen Cooper is eating her father and goes after her mother, and then goes upstairs when there's more. You know, after she's killed everybody in the basement, and the basement is quiet and still, she's attracted to the noise upstairs of of all the other ghouls. You know, trying to break in. That's where uh, that's where the kind of instinct comes from. And more than anything, I mean, that's it's uh, it's a it's a pretty continuous um, and logical step in the movie, um, the way the living dead act, uh, whether or not that was like, a you know, that was something that was decided um, uh, and, and everybody abided by it or if it's just something that came naturally from the discussions of keeping it, you know, logical. 
um, the, the living dead act on a kind of instinct, um, yeah. which would, would have them, uh, you know, pick up a, a rock to smash a barrier, you know, smash right. a glass barrier or a window right. uh, or pick up a, uh, a, you know, the nearest uh, table leg or cement trowel to bring down a larger uh, target. And so all of that stuff makes sense. Um, you know, the, uh, when Johnny is down for the count, he's no longer moving. Right. He's no longer what the, uh, you know, what a ghoul would go after. The ghoul goes after the movement. He sees movement somewhere, and that's the next target. And I'm going to go after that. Because it's pretty obvious that they're not really uh, the, the eating of the eating of the body is not a um, you know is not the that's just instinctual it's not actually exactly. doing anything for corpses for exactly. reanimated corpses so um, but to get to Devoy's question here uh, now I have to find it um, he was asking what was it like pulling Judy O'Day out of the front door and that scene was the scariest for him and uh, just to comment on, you know, why that scene is scary and effective. I mean, it comes right directly after Karen Cooper attacking and killing her mother, which almost comes out of like left field and, and the way it's, it has a lot of impact and is very brutal, but that's like one of the film's lowest points. And then when you, you know, for the, for the audience, um, you know, things have, have gotten so nightmarish that you can't imagine anything worse and now here is a character that we've seen now joining the ranks of the living dead and mindlessly coming after his, uh, his sister. And so it just ties the whole thing together. Um, well, I can honestly say that it was um, for all of the amount of improvisation and uh, you know, thinking on our feet, the return of Johnny was a very, very, very calculated moment. Um, starting with uh, the appearance of the, the hand uh, on the door frame to establish, okay, yes, this is Johnny. And um, it was one of the scenes where there was no um, onset fooling around. Uh, I was determined that I was going to lock my vision on Barbara and never, ever waver from that. Um, and it, it came off quite successfully. Um, it was highly, highly intense. And when we, the night that we filmed that scene, um, was dead silence. I believe we did two takes and both takes were exactly the same. I did not veer at all. From, I, I had one target and one target only and that was Barbara. And to grab her and get her out onto the porch where she was enveloped by me and a bunch of my new pals. And uh, so there was no monkey business. Uh, that was a, a purposely a very, very direct and intense scene. And it, it, I think it, per, it worked pretty well. Besides the, um, uh, the, in, the intense stare on your target, on your movie sister, um, was there any other kind of direction or any other kind of idea? Uh, like, you know, again, you knew you wanted to place the driving glove in, you know, in view. It, it Again, I always say Night Living Dead is, you know, a lot of happy accidents. Um, the fact that a black driving glove, you know, is very on, ominous on a white door frame and just the way that it's like planted there. And again, you know, George just knew how to, how to shoot that and go with it. Was there any other kind of uh, ideas or direction that you got in terms of being a ghoul or being, you know, among the first living dead? In, in I have to say, uh, but 
but at, at that point, uh, in addition to working on Night of the Living Dead, as far as as far as George and I, George and I had been living together, literally sleeping in the same uh, fold-out bed for uh, the better part of uh, seven or eight years at that point. So uh, we had um, professional experience together, private experience together. We what we we had a commonality in how we thought about things and how we solved problems in our da uh, daily business life. So um, I have to say that uh, we were pretty much on the same kind of page. And uh, a, a lot of it was nonverbal communication. How about if I do this? Okay, then, and that, then, that triggered a whole sequence of how he wanted to have the, the remainder of that sequence look, including the absolute disappearance of Barbara into this, uh, the, the, the choreography of how I took her out. Uh, that, that was all rehearsed. And the, the last time you see Barbara is she is literally being swallowed by a porch full of ghouls. Yeah, I mean, Barbara is really the, the only one that that happens to, that actually dies at the hands of the, of the yeah. living dead. Um, you, you know, Tom and Judy, yeah, but, you know, I mean, they get, they get torn apart, but that's like after the fact. They right. they you know they die because of like circumstance. You know, uh, gasoline gets spilled and it's going to catch on fire. And um, you know the ghouls don't have the living dead don't have any such um, you know concerns, <laughs> except right. you know stay away from the fire. But but otherwise the living dead don't you know they there's no uh, there's no um, there's nothing. Uh, emotionally that's holding them back they're going to go after right. exactly. their you know except on this instinctive level to avoid brightness or avoid fire they're going to go after their target and there's it doesn't matter if they're being shot at and they're losing an arm or ear or or they lose the ability to walk they're going to crawl right. and exactly. uh, so that that comes across great in in that scene the determination to uh to get um to get the character of barbara but um so anyway, um, we could talk about that for a while, but we should save the making of the film for another episode. Uh, I just wanted to point out uh, Jeannie, uh, Jeannie Bashovan, who's Jeannie Jeffries. Everybody knows better as Jeannie Jeffries, the, uh, uh, who worked on Dawn of the Dead and appears in the film as the plaid ghoul, plaid, uh, the blonde ghoul wearing the plaid shirt. Um, She's just saying hello, and I wanted to point out Jeannie here because she will be at Weekend of the Dead together with you and Gary and John Russo and all the others. So That's absolutely great. I'm glad to hear that. Hi, Jeannie. So um, I know our pal, producer pal here has been bothering me to wrap it up. So we're going to wrap it up. But uh, what I want to do here is um, I had an idea for uh for next week um we've been talking about the new night of living dead store russ you've seen the store i have have you been in it yes i i so have what's I what's have, your favorite product <laughs> I, I have that do you have like one of every johnny thing or <laughs> there's not a whole lot of johnny in the store yet but we'll get there i think there's a there's a johnny uh, they're coming to get you, Barbara Muck. But um, right. uh, anyway, uh, what we want to do is uh, we want to drive everybody over to the store, you know, get or drive traffic to the store. So uh, we're going to have a little contest. Next week's episode is going to be about Image 10 working together with Janus Films Criterion. Of course, the great Criterion release, 
um, you know, on home video. Uh, there's actually been, you know, several there. There's been the uh, um, the Blu-ray, the DVD, and then two years ago, the 4K UHD version. And there's been releases, uh, as we talked about last week, there's been releases all over the world, uh, legitimate releases of Night of the Living Dead on home video in Japan, France, Germany, Italy, um, of course, the UK and Ireland. So next week, uh, we're going to be talking about the Criterion, uh, Image 10's relationship with Criterion and Janus Films, uh, what they've done to get the film on solid ground and streaming. And our guest is going to be Curtis Tsui, the producer at the Criterion Collection who worked on, uh, well, he was the, the producer on the home video release. He's one of the best producers I've ever worked with from any company. And um, what we're going to do is if uh, we're going to be adding some new products in the next few days to the Night of the Living Dead store, online store, nightofthelivingdead.store. That's where you want to go. And everybody who orders between now and our podcast next week, we're going to have Curtis pick from those customers a winning uh, individual, and that person's going to get a special autographed item that I have set aside here. We have actually a lot of cool items like that, but you're going to get a cool uh, autographed item, which I'll reveal next week. So head on over to nightofthelivingdead.store. Um, place an order this week for whatever you want. It could be the pillows. It could be t-shirt it could be our our great little uh you know our great little hat here which is too small so that doesn't fit on my fat head uh, but there are bigger sizes that you can get and um whatever it is that you order we're going to have everybody you know we'll have a list of all the people who have ordered and we're going to have curtis select a winner uh randomly from that list of those who have ordered and you will get a cool autographed item which I will, re will reveal next week. So until then, thank you, Russ, for joining us. Appreciate it. Um, it's always good conversation. And as we were telling everybody, you can see Russ September 21st at the Michigan Theater in Jackson, Michigan, September 27th through the 29th in Marlboro, Massachusetts at TerrorCon. And then uh, what are the dates again for... Uh, uh, I believe it's November, let's see, November 2nd and 3rd in Manchester at the Weekend of the Dead. Hey, Jim, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, I have done something here. Uh, I can now hear you. For a moment, I couldn't. Okay. Uh, I have uh, seemingly knocked myself out of the picture here. <laughs> so I, I, and I don't know how to get myself back. Well, we so, can hear you. So can you, can you hear us? Oh yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we can hear you. We can see you. So even though you can't see it, you're still on camera. Okay. So we're good. So we're just wrapping it up. But um, any last thing you want to say to everybody before we close it out? Well, I, I do want to say that in terms of the people from Janus Films and Criterion, of all of the people that I've ever dealt with in the film business, these people are several cuts above everyone else. They are dedicated, they are wonderful human beings, and I am so glad to see what's happening with their very own brand of uh, Janus and Criterion because they're just, they're a superb company to do business with. And, um, you know, they stand behind their product and they give a lot of thought and consideration to what they release. And uh, I, I, I couldn't be happier for their success. And I'm so happy that Night of the Living Dead is under, finally, after years, after decades of, um, people 
uh, distributors who were not so attentive uh, to be under the umbrella of Criterion. They're, they're just great people. And, you know, I can attest um, from Image 10 day-to-day -day business that it is uh, six years after it's booming um, in terms of uh, the Criterion release, which was exactly why we went to that company uh, with this film, uh, why that was the that was the first and only choice, because a film like Night of the Living Dead that has had the distributor issues and the legal issues that it has had, like you're talking about, um, it, it needs to be there and available and at the forefront constantly, or else um, you're just letting the junk in. You're letting people come in. You're letting other people come in and just rip it off. And um, uh, for that reason, uh, and again, as I said last week, and I'm sure I'm going to say it again this week, um, despite our, despite Criterion Janus Films being our first and only choice to rest the movie, you know, under the care of these uh, of this company of that company, um, we still had no idea um, that streaming was around the corner that uh you know this kind of on demand digital delivery system was was happening and that just wasn't our focus at the time the focus was to get it out to the fans um who had waited so many years and and a good number of fans were hoping that there would be something like a criterion release like a uh, you know a top of the line rolls royce edition of the, the film with all the extras and all the the bells and whistles and um that was really what our what our focus was and uh it, it not only to have that but to have it constantly be available and the only company that i saw really doing that that doesn't lose focus of their the properties was, is criterion i mean they've had some classic film titles for some 20 30 years or more so uh that was just the right place for Night of the Living Dead to end up. And it's opened the doors for the film to reach a greater audience. But we will talk about that in um, next week's episode. So, uh, again, next week is uh, Wednesday. Uh, that's uh, September 11th. So we'll see you then. And uh, also 8 o'clock Eastern time. So until then. Uh, take care. Russ, are you going to tune in? <laughs> I absolutely will be. Okay, great. <laughs> well, you're still afraid. I'm not afraid. I've dragged you up in deep so straight. Go ahead. Haven't you had enough? They're coming to get you, Barbara. <laughs> okay, is that it?